Hi, I'm Simon. Thanks for tuning in to The Ordinary Filmmaker. Subscribe to get notification of new videos like this one so you don't miss any news, rumors, gear reviews, or tutorials. And to make things just a little bit more interesting, I'm giving away a brand new Canon EOS R5 full frame mirrorless camera to one lucky viewer. Details are in the description down below, or you can watch this video here. But please take a look at the terms and conditions as there are some age and location restrictions. And now, for a quick recap of the week's news. Now, the first item that I think grabbed most of the attention, and certainly most of the headlines, was the crazy specs for the Canon EOS R1. Now, starting off, it was supposed to be 85, or is supposed to be 85 megapixels. Now, keep in mind that Canon aims this camera at high speed, high speed fast action sports photographers. And 85 megapixels is something that you would expect for a high megapixel version of the Canon EOS R5. They don't really go well together. And if you look at the other two cameras, the Sony Alpha 1, it's 50 megapixels. And the Nikon D6, sorry, that was the previous one, the successor to the Nikon D6, the Z9, it's supposed to be 45 to 50 megapixels. I really don't see it being 85 megapixels. And also the ISO range, 160 to 1.64 million. And oh, if you look closely at the specifications, which I've got lined up right here, you'll see that it seems to take a lot of the rumored specifications for the R1, like a quad pixel autofocus, uh, global shutter. Then it takes stuff for the rumored uh, Canon R5S, the high megapixel version of the R5. And then of course, things that are from Sony, like a 9.44 million dot EVF. Also in the news this week, Nikon provided a development announcement for their successor to the D6, make sure I say that correctly, in the Nikon Z9. Now this camera is going to be around 45 to 50 megapixels, which tells you, well, and they already told us, they're going to be supporting 8K video. Now frame rate is supposed to be around 20 frames per second, which in itself isn't slow for a fast action sports camera if it can nail auto exposure and focus every time. But with Sony doing 30 frames per second and with Canon yet to announce their camera, I'm really curious to see if it has 20 megapixels and if Canon actually goes past 30 megapixels or at least delivers 30 megapixels, which I think they will. Also in the news, Apple was supposed to have a March announcement to introduce new Apple MacBook Pros. That's not happening, it's getting delayed. No surprises there. Now these new MacBooks are gonna have the MagSafe return, they're gonna have an SD card return, and they're gonna have that same keyboard that we like in the older MacBook Pros or the, the 2019 MacBook Pro. It's gonna have the same speakers, but the really big thing here is it's gonna have that second generation or second iteration of the M processor and it's either gonna be called the M2 or the M1X. So that's pretty well it for news. Oh, and Sony introduced a firmware update for the A7 III. But now this video, um, I wanted this video to have a spring theme and I didn't get a lot of questions on spring, but I certainly feel like it's spring. I'm shooting outside, look behind me. Doesn't it feel a little bit more like spring? I'm not wearing a winter coat, I'm not wearing gloves. But in the theme of spring, what I'd like to do is show you a couple of videos that were submitted for the spring challenge. The first up is from Jesse. Now, Jesse, when he put this out there, he said, oh, I don't know, it wasn't the best edit. And people tend to do that when they're not confident in their work, but within a few seconds, I got an incredible sense of spring and it felt warm and inviting. And I think Jesse did a really good job here. Now I've muted the music because I don't have a copyright for it, but if you'd like to catch the full video that Jesse put out, um, I've got the link in the description down below. And our second entry is from Dean. Now Dean's in the UK and I kind of got that sense right from the beginning when I saw all the swans. It takes me back to 1979 when I was a wee little lad and I was living and going to school just outside of London. And I just, I, I still remember to this day the parks with the rivers and all the swans that were there and me as a wee little nine-year-old feeding the swans. It was, uh, I have fond memories of that. So this video to me really helps give me a sense of, um, it brings, brings that little kid back me and it definitely gives me a sense of spring. So well done. And again, um, if you'd like to watch these videos in full with the music, go ahead and look in the links down below in the description but it's not too late to submit your video to the spring challenge. The challenge or the contest closes on March the 31st. That's what, three weeks away? Ish, under three weeks. 
So it's not too late to submit your video. And at this point, both Dean and Jesse, I almost forgot his name, have a 50-50 chance of winning this. So go ahead and submit your video. And something else I'm also gonna do, I'm gonna take five, five that I think are the best videos and I'm gonna put them in a poll. I'm gonna have you guys vote on which should get the prize. And the prize is gonna be a 512 gigabyte Angelbird CF Express card along with a card reader. But for the four runner-ups, you're also gonna get an ordinary filmmaker hat. I was actually gonna wear it today because the sun's kind of poking in my eyes a little bit, but it kind of threw off the autofocus quite a bit, so I decided to keep it off. So anyhow, I will put this poll out on April the 1st, so it's not too late. Look, I know what you're thinking. Simon, I'm a photographer, I don't really do video. That's fine. Take a bunch of really great still shots that celebrate spring and put it into some sort of Ken Burns type video. I'm not telling you what you should do in this video, at least that it should be 30 seconds long at the minimum. So go ahead and submit that. And, um, you know, this is a really good prize. I, this is a somewhere between four and $500 retail US for the 512 gigabyte CF Express card. And if you've got a Sony and can't use this, well, you can flip it on Craigslist or Kijiji or eBay and make some money back from it. So again, thanks to Angelbird for donating this prize. Like staying informed and knowing when my latest video comes out, subscribe and choose all notifications so that you can be notified as soon as a video comes out. Not happy with YouTube's notification system? Not getting notifications or they're coming in late? Well, visit OrdinaryFilmmaker.com and I have a new notification system there that notifies you within a minute of the video coming out. So as soon as it's published, you're gonna get notified. But now, let's go ahead and answer your questions on Ask Me Anything. If you would like your question answered on an Ask Me Anything video, for example, next week, go ahead and submit your question in the comments section down below and I, may be and I might be answering your question next week. And now for our first question. Jonathan asks, with the release of new flagship cameras, is there a project that you can't take on because, well, your current camera lacks that feature? No, not in the least. Um, I'm currently shooting with a Canon EOS R5 and it's, at this point, it's up here and my capabilities are down here. So I'm not fully utilizing the camera's capabilities. But for those of you who've been following me for some time now, you'll notice that I'm exposed a whole lot better and things are working a little bit better. So I'm getting better with the camera. But that being said, there are some things with the R5 that I'm not happy with. Uh, there's too many limits. There's a 30 minute record limit, which doesn't need to be there. And of course there's an overheat limit and those overheat limits do get in the way. The record limits get in the way. And when I'm shooting, I'm constantly looking down here. I'm using camera connect cause it's warm enough outside. And I have to keep watching that clock. And once I'm, when I'm doing that, when I'm keeping in mind that sort of stuff, it's getting my mind, it's getting my concentration off what I'm trying to do and that's produce content for you. So it is frustrating. It's very frustrating, but the Canon EOS R1 is most likely gonna cost around $6,500. That's an awful lot of money and if I go ahead and sell my R5, I'm not gonna get the full amount back. So I'm faced with a dilemma. Do I upgrade or do I choose some sort of workaround? And there are workarounds. I keep talking about this time and time again, and I don't know why um, Atomos doesn't just give me some sort of a sponsorship deal, because if you hook up an external recorder to the Canon EOS R5, that 30 minute record limit is gone. The overheat is not gonna be an issue. And you're not gonna have to transcode in post. So you can edit right off the SSD in post, and that's terrific. Now, I've, I've heard some comments from Sony users saying, ha ha ha, get a Sony, you don't have to deal with that. Well, no, that's not fair. While Sony doesn't have those limits, they do have limits on storage. So right now, CF Express Type A cards, the largest one I could find was 160 gigabytes. And on B&H, it's $400. Now, I'm using a CF Express Type B card right now. It's $800, twice the price, but it gives me eight times the storage. So it's two terabytes. So... An external recorder really helps you in a lot of ways. So if you look at the price of an external recorder like the Ninja 5, you're going to pay, I believe it's $5.99 right now, but then on Black Friday, they usually knock 20% off. You can get it for $4.99, which is $100 more than a Type A CF Express card for your Sony. And how much does it cost for a one, two, three, or sorry, one, two, or four terabyte SSD? Well, a whole lot less than the storage. So they really offer you an awful lot of benefits. Plus you can choose to get the best codecs. You can get, use Apple ProRes 422, Apple ProRes RAW, uh, Avis codecs. So you can get much better quality right off the sensor. So I highly recommend an external recorder, whether you're shooting Sony or Canon. 
So back to the R1 or the current mirrorless cameras, there's nothing right now that I think is going to make me want to buy them, but we'll just have to wait and see. Lloyd says, 50 megapixels at 30 frames per second. Can you imagine how many cards you'd require if you're shooting sports all day? Not ideal. Okay, yes, you're going to use up an awful lot of storage, but if you're a professional sports photographer, you're not going to be going out there with just one card. Even if you could buy a two terabyte CF Express Type A card, you're going to shoot with multiple cards. The simple reason being is, if one card fails, you don't want to lose everything. So you're going to shoot with multiple cards, you're going to go out there with multiple cards, and I, I, I do agree. Right now for Sony, the CF Express Type A, they're limited in size. We don't see any one terabytes. We don't see anything like 512 gigabytes. You can go with V90 cards that are pushing up there in terms of capacity, and that's fine. But yeah, when it comes to taking photos, if you're a professional, um, you're going to be recording to both card slots. Uh, that will give you some redundancy, and I'd be going with something like a minimum of 256 gigabytes and probably 512 on those V90 cards, and they're going to be expensive. But if you're going to be shooting video, then I would say, you know what, and while it's great that Sony allows you, Canon, are you hearing this? Sony allows you to record to both cards at the same time with video, and that's a huge benefit. It gives you redundancy. But those cards are very expensive, and they don't have high-capacity cards right now. So if you're going to record an all-I or some of the higher bit rates on the Sonys, then what I might recommend is, again, take a look at an external recorder like the Ninja 5, because now you can put in cheaper storage like, what is a one terabyte SSD cost, $100 or less. So that, that's a really good option there too. But don't, don't let the constraints stop you from doing your work or from dreaming. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, that, that, that's also one of the reasons, uh, Lloyd, where I'm really surprised that all these cameras are trying to get 8K and these are high speed sports fast action cameras and I would have thought 30 megapixels is really good. But I think with a declining market, the camera companies are figuring like, you know what, we can't, we can't ignore video. We got to put 8K in these. Um, all the professionals, whether it's TV station broadcasters, 8K is becoming a thing. So we want to be there. We don't want to be the one left out. But I do understand your concerns. John asks, casting aside the CR0 Canon Rumors article, what are your expectations for the Canon EOS R1? What are your hopes? And when can we expect an announcement? Well, John, um, the Canon EOS R1 is Canon's answer to professional photographers that need to capture things fast. So fast action, sports photographers. Um, I would like to see a minimum of 30 frames per second. I actually meant to say a minimum of 20 frames per second, but it's a bit of a Freudian slip there. It should have at least a minimum of 20 frames per second, but I wouldn't be surprised and I would hope that Canon would give it at least 30 frames per second. Uh, the Sony Alpha 1 can do it. And depending on where they go with the sensor size, they could push past 30 frames per second. Now, in terms, of, in terms of the sensor size, we know this is going to have 8K video, so I hope they put in something like a 45 or 50 megapixel sensor. Now, if they go 45 megapixels, then we can expect similar video specifications as we, as we do with a Canon R5. The only, <laughs> the one thing I wish they would do, though, uh, with the R1, is give us 8K, sorry, 4K oversample 1080. They don't. Uh, the Sony A7S III gives us 4K oversampled 1080, which is really nice because a lot of people still shoot in 1080. And it's nice to get that really detailed 1080. Um, you can't with the R5. The, the 1080 is still pretty soft. So in terms of video, the 1 Series cameras always have better video than the 5 Series camera. Now, it's not a huge jump ahead. Uh, so for example, the uh, 1DX Mark II shot 4K 60, whereas the 5D Mark IV shot 4K 30. Uh, it, they both had 120 frames per second in 1080, but the 1DX had it in um, 1080, whereas the 5D Mark IV had it in 720. So what could I see different in the R1 versus the Canon EOS R5? Well, I think most likely what will happen is we'll first of all lose any overheating. I wouldn't be surprised if Canon pushes up to 50 megapixels so they can give us 8.6K oversampled 8K RAW, which would be quite phenomenal. Uh, in terms of video capabilities, I don't think we're going to get 8K 60. I don't think we're going to get 4K 240, but I would like to see 4K go up to about 180 frames per second. Let, let's push that up a little bit more. I'm, I'm sure we can do it. In terms of photography, more dynamic range, um, better detail. 
uh, less noise, uh, greater ISO range. We're not going to see 1.64 million on the top end of the ISO range, but I do expect that it's going to be a whole lot better. I mean, this, this camera has to do stills very well. And what I want to be able to do, even if you're spraying and praying, I want to hit 100% of those frames in focus and exposed properly. Uh, and any tools that can provide to help us nail the shot every time. And that's what matters to me. But also, the body's one of the least important things. What really matters are the super telephoto, telephoto and zoom lenses, and even the primes that can come with this camera. So I hope they release a whole bunch of really terrific glass to support this. And from what we can see in the rumors, there's an awful lot of really, really good stuff that's supposed to be coming out, or supposed to be announced with the R1. And we're expecting an announcement for this summer. Um, I hope that continues as planned. Apparently, Canon is, their production is almost back to normal, and by April, things should be back to normal, so we can expect a firmer update on the R5. We can start to expect more rumors coming out, because once companies start signing NDAs, it doesn't mean they won't leak stuff out. It just means stuff does eventually leak. That means they're going to be given information by Canon, and we'll see some of that stuff leaking out, so I'm really excited to see that. Jodoc asks, why doesn't Sigma produce Canon RF lenses? They'd earn a ton of money. They're going to. Um, they're not going to ignore Canon. It has the most market share of any camera company out there. And right now, RF systems or R systems, they're, they're taking off. They're, they're selling really, really well. But unlike Sony, um, Canon's not releasing technical drawings or technical information to allow third-party companies to go out there and be able to make glass. Canon wants to make as much money as they can while they can. So these other companies have to go out there and reverse engineer the amount to be able to produce glass for it. So that's the main reason why. It's going to come. I don't know when. Um, Sigma hinted that, you know, yes, there's a lot of work involved with these things, but they didn't come out and give us anything definite. So I wouldn't be surprised if we're looking at next year. Joseph asks, have you tested your AngelBird cards with the speed test from Blackmagic or any other speed test software or hardware? Yes, I actually have. I put out a video when I did a review of the AngelBird uh, Safe Express cards back um, last year. And, well, it passed the test. And I, here, here's the thing when it comes to these tests. These specification tests don't mean a whole lot to me. What really matters to me is real world recording. So since I did that video on the AngelBird, I've been using them ever since. They've been my main cards for my cameras. Whenever I'm shooting channel work, it's in there. It's two terabytes. I don't have to worry about exceeding my card, and I really like that about it. So here's the thing. Here's what I've shot. I've shot 8K video. I've shot 8K with C-Log, which is somewhere, I can't remember if it's around 1300 megabits per second. It's really, really high bandwidth. And I've shot a ton of stills without ever filling up the card, without any buffering issues. And those are the real t world tests that matter to me. It's the ability to record an awful lot of data and continue, continuously do so in a trustworthy way. When I'm not shooting in 8K, which is most of the times, I'm shooting in 4K HQ. And when I'm shooting outside, C-Log is always on, not my studio pieces. So in 4K HQ with C-Log, I'm pushing 940 megabits per second. And a lot of these videos, like this one here, is probably going to be about 60 minutes long. And I've never, ever, ever had an issue with being able to get the... Um, the content onto the storage and of course get that story content off the storage so uh, they more than meet the speeds now they're not as fast as cards such as the pro grade 325 cobalt but the right speed doesn't matter so much as long as i can record 8k raw which is the limit of my camera right now i'm covered and i've been able to record 8k not raw but 8k all i with canon log on and that's a pretty as i said it <laughs> consumes a lot of bandwidth AngelBird does say they can record 12K. I haven't been able to test that at this point, so I can only trust what they're saying is true because everything else they've said is true. Um, now, the AngelBird cards aren't as fast on the read as the Cobalt cards, but you've got to look at the price. Think of the Cobalt cards as your Ferrari FF FXX. It's super fast. It can do 1,700, and a minimum sustained write speed, I think, is around 1,400. Megabytes, not bits. And a byte is eight times as big as a bit. So... For what I'm shooting, um, the Angel Birds are more than fast enough. And what I like about the Angel Birds, I decide to go, what's more important to me is capacity than speed, because the speed of these things are more than fast enough that I need the capacity. And getting the content off the CF Express card 
doesn't take as long. Now, I've made the mistake of recording two V30 cards before because the Canon R5, even though you tell it which cards you're going to record video, every now and then it decides, yeah, we're going to put it on the V30 card. And yes, it can take an awful long time to get off, but the Safe Express cards by Angel Bird are very fast, and they also make V90 cards too, which are pretty fast. I mean, as fast as UHS-2 cards can be these days, which I think is around 300 megabytes per second. Anti-Gravity asks, Am I the only one who really liked the touch bar multifunction bar? Now, Augment is asking or referring to the, the touch bar or the multifunction bar on the Apple MacBook computers. And when Apple first announced this, I thought, hmm, this is interesting for video. I could really get into this. This sounds really, really intriguing. And then they bumped up the price by 300 US dollars, which is about 500 Canadian. And you know what? I haven't bought a single Mac since. It's not that I have a problem with the bar, and I think it's not that a lot of people have a problem with the bar. It's that Apple took an extra $300 US out of our pockets to deliver it. And um, I, I just, I'm not willing to pay that tax, that high premium there. I just don't think it's worth it. I don't think the extra capability I get um, is worth it. The most I want to spend on a, a MacBook is around $3,000 US. And uh, I really do hope that the next generation, the ones that have the M processors, will, because they're not using Intel's, chips which are faster, or sorry, uh, which are more expensive, and um, they're able to control everything, and it doesn't have that multifunction bar, they should be cheaper by at least $300. But I know you're chuckling because this is Apple, but we'll just have to wait and see, won't we? Man Friendly Church says, getting irritated as I have a few questions that don't fit your theme, and this is the third week in a row where you're limiting your questions. Well, I'm sorry that it's irritating you that I'm not getting to your questions right away. But you got to keep in mind that I'm limited to about 10 questions a week, so I'm not going to be able to answer everybody's questions every week. And to try and create, make things more interesting, to try and grow, to try new things, I'm coming up with different themes. And you're right. I've had themes the last couple of weeks in a row. And this week, I didn't get many questions related to Spring Challenge. So as you can see and hear, I'm addressing other questions. So submit a question. You never know. I might answer it. But I'm not going to guarantee that you're going to get your question surfaced and answered every week. It just depends on what kind of theme I'm trying to go with. And even when I don't mention there's a theme, I look at the questions and I try to create a story. I try to touch on different subjects or try to create a holistic theme while the subjects are different. You know, we're talking about memory. We're talking about external recorders. We're talking about cameras. They all kind of blend in together and tell a nice theme. So sorry that you're irritated, but I, you know, I'm not going to make promises. I'm going to do the best I can to answer as many questions as I can, but I'm going to keep the limit to about 10 so I can get these shot and filled on my lunch breaks. Bookley asks, how do you convert ProRes to use on your computer? Well, I have a Mac, so I use Apple's compressor. It's $50 US, and there are plenty of ways you can convert. You don't need to use compressor. Uh, you can even use Final Cut Pro if you're using that. You can use other tools. But the reason why I use compressor is I can batch convert. So I can take, you know, let's say I've been out shooting a bunch of family videos and I got about 100 clips. Bring those all in, tell it to convert to Apple ProRes 422. And let's say I also just shot a video for my channel. Well, I can bring that in too. I can choose different settings, because I do. And I can, tell it start, I can have it to start batch. And it'll convert everything to multiple. So I can have, for example, all my videos that I shot, all my family stuff are on this CF card and the other ones are on an SSD. And I can do them all at once and then go away and do something else. So I really like that. I love the functionality of it. And I can tweak with it. I can, I can publish and compress 8K. And I find that Compressor gets it right more times than Final Cut Pro. Once in a while, I do get an error. And if I do, then what I do is I export in a master file. And then I take that and bring it into Compressor and it don't have any problems. I'm not sure why, but when you start to get errors, uh, with either Final Cut or Compressor, and it's just one of those areas and you have no idea what it is, and it's a long piece, you're not going to reshoot it. Just export as a master file. This is a great tip. Export as a master file, and then throw it into Compressor, and you're going to be fine. So here's our first weather question, or spring-related question. Cloud Strife asks, what's the best way to clean your gear during the rainy, muddy spring season? Well, first of all, I hope that you don't get mud on your camera because, well, it's abrasive. You've got to be very careful getting mud off. Now, depending on where it falls on the camera, you can use a spray bottle or you can use um, a light amount of water and just spray it off so the water brings it off. Again, you want to make sure you've got weather-resistant gear if you're trying this because you don't want to risk getting it in the seals. 
The other thing you can do is if you let it dry, depending on where it is on the body or the lens, what you can do is get a brush and you can just sort of brush it off a little bit, then spray it down and use like a damp microfiber card to get it off. But keep in mind, if you're working with dried dirt, it's quite abrasive and you can risk scratching stuff. So if you've got mud on your lens, this is where you have to be very careful. And what I would do is just go ahead and take off your UV filter, your ND filter, wash them in warm water. Don't put any solvents in or anything, just warm water and then shake it um, and then use a, like a damp uh, microfiber cloth to get any remaining dirt off and then clean it off and take it out and let it dry and then use your normal lens cleaner. Uh, if you're not using UV filters or ND filters, you gotta be very, very careful. You scratch those lenses, um, yeah, you, you better be shooting with a shallow depth of field. Um, you wanna be very careful. Never try to get dirt off of a lens when it's dry, you're going to cause scratches. You can even breathe on it to give it, if, if, if it's like, even, here's what I do. Even if I have fingerprints on it, I'll go, I'll breathe on it. And I use a, I'll use a microfiber cloth to clean it off. But if I've got dirt on it, um, so I use UV filters all the time, uh, especially in the spring, especially if I'm going to be going out to an environment where I know there's a risk of my gear getting muddy or wet. Uh, you really want to protect that lens because you, you scratch it and it's expensive. Other things. Um, if I brush the spray bottles, yep, UV soak, yep, microfiber cloths. Also think of your gear. You, you want to have your gear that's a little bit weather resistant too. You also want to think of raincoats for your cameras. You can get these things if you're going to be shooting in the rain. You can put your camera in a raincoat. They have them on Amazon and camera stores. And yes, these are weather resistant, but they're not waterproof. They're not IP68 or even IP67. So you get these wet and you can still damage them. So I would still take precautions. Um, camera bag, we want to have it weatherproof, weather sealed, because uh, a lot of the stuff you're going to put in there, such as your SD cards, even if you put them in a sealed case, you know, you, you want to think ahead. The last thing you want to do is go out there, get some amazing video and you've lost several thousand dollars worth of gear, especially when you look at CF Express cards where they're type A or type B, they're certainly not cheap. And our last spring themed question is from Stop the FOMO. What are the colors or images you try to capture to represent spring? So for me, when I, a lot of what I shoot, it's, it's documentary style. I wanna capture things as accurately as they are. So I wanna capture colors as they are. I wanna capture the lighting as it is. So for me, what's very important, uh, let's talk about color accuracy and what I do what I find is the most important is you want to try to color balance so it's good to have some grays in the in the in the um, scene so you can color balance quickly and easily later I shoot Canon log all the time when I'm shooting outside because I want to make sure that I get accurate colors in the shadows and the highlights I want to get that extra dynamic range so it tells a much better story of what's really happening because our eyes have pretty good dynamic range and I want to capture as close to as possible what the eye see. So that's a tool that I use. But in terms of spring, what does it mean to me? The sounds of the birds, uh, getting close-ups of birds and other animals, um, geese and ducks and all sorts of other animals are flying in this time of year. So that's a big part of it too. But also the tulips and daffodils coming up. A whole bunch of them are coming up behind me here. And unfortunately, I don't think I'm gonna have the time to shoot them for this video because I'm actually recording this Friday on my lunch break. I really don't have a lot of time this week. Um, just one of those weeks. But spring to me is about life. It's about rebirth. It's about, you see all the animals. Spring is the greatest time where they come together. They have these mating rituals. They have these wonderful dances. And to be able to get out there and capture as much of that as possible, it's huge. And already here in Ontario right now, we've had several days where it's approached 60 degrees well it's gone past 60 degrees and even my grass here it's greener than it's more green than it normally is this time of year once the snow goes so i'm hoping we have a really uh spring um really uh what, what's someone i trying to say here we have spring is early and it's sustained but that's it for now thank you so much for watching the ordinary filmmaker now um, a little bit of behind the scenes here you'll notice just in the last couple of minutes my loud neighbors are back and they like to come outside and they like to shout when they talk. They're not quiet. So hopefully with the um, task that I'm using, it doesn't grab a lot of that. And also with my in-camera mic, I've actually got my Sennheiser hooked up and the mic is pointing upwards so I can capture more of the ambient sounds from birds 
and uh, some other things. And uh, normally I used to put this right on top of the camera and have it point directly at me, and that worked quite well. But I was shooting with the EF 50mm f1.2, and the focus motor on that was quiet enough that it didn't pick it up. But this thing here, this thing's loud. I cannot have it on the camera, so I just basically uh, take the Sennheiser 440, I plug it into the hot shoe of my 70D, and the 70D acts as a holder pointing directly up. So hopefully that worked out. And hopefully my exposure is a whole lot better this time. Let me know what you think. I'm going to have a pretty good idea once I go inside and I put this in the computer, I can see how well it is exposed. Now before I came out here, well, sorry, before I shot, I did shoot a couple of few test patches and exposure looked good, the histogram looked good, and the, uh, the waveforms looked good too. But the sun has moved quite a bit since I've started shooting this. So we'll just have to see how well it looks. But that does conclude another video. Sorry I'm a little late this week getting it out. Well, you, it's still coming out on Saturday, but a little late get asking for your questions. But uh, there was a problem with Google. I just couldn't submit the questions. I tried to do that on Wednesday. So next week we should be back to our regular schedule. But if you do have questions for me, go ahead and drop them in the comment section down below. I just might be answering your questions next week. But please, don't forget the spring challenge. Give it a shot. At, right now you've got a 50-50 chance of winning. That's, those are pretty good odds for such a wonderful prize. And I'm not going to be sending the prize to you. I'm going to be, once we do have the winner selected, or once we've selected our winner through voting, I'm going to talk to you on Facebook. You're going to provide me the basic information that's needed to be able to ship it out to you. And I'm going to be sending that to Angelbird, and they're going to be sending you the package directly. So you'll get it a whole lot quicker. But that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. Once again, as I'm out here shooting in the spring, don't forget to subscribe for your chance to win two Angelbird 128GB AV Pro MK2 V90 UHS-2 SD cards. Now one thing I really wish Angelbird would do is come up with some simple short names like call it the Angelbird 128GB AV Pro or the Ed or the Jennifer, something short because that's an awfully long name. Also with that prize bundle you're going to be getting an Angelbird dual UHS-2 SD card reader. But I also have another prize bundle, that's the Ulanzi LED light prize bundle. It's going to include underwater lights, um, well, I'm forgetting now, the underwater lights, uh, various flat panel lights, and I, I can't remember. There's, there's five different lights included. And um, I'll be awarding these two prize bundle once, bundles once the channel reaches 30,000 subscribers. And then I'll be offering up other prize bundles all the way up to 100,000 subscribers at which point I'll be awarding a brand new Canon EOS R5 full frame mirrorless camera to one lucky viewer on that bombshell. Thanks so much for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. We'll see you again soon.